Hey everyone, and welcome to Writing Our Way Out, the podcast. My name is Dave Coogan. This show is based on the book, Writing Our Way Out, Memoirs from Jail, the creative culmination of a writing class that I started at the Richmond City Jail and which grew into a journey of reentry with 10 men. In the book and on this show, we explore all of the conditions and the traps and turning points on the path to prison in America and the way to stay free. One of those men from the class is with us here today, Stan Craddock. We last heard from Stan on the show at the end of season one in the episode that we did about all those Confederate monuments coming down. That show was the prison of white supremacy. What's happening, Stan? Hey, how you doing, Dave? Everything good? Everything's wonderful. Hello, everybody. All right, and also with us tonight on the show is Dr. Shermaine Jones. Uh, Dr. Jones is a professor of African-American literature at Virginia Commonwealth University, one of my colleagues. Welcome to the show, Shermaine. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, well, we're lucky to have you. Um, As some of you uh, already know, the the writing class that Stan and I started with Kelvin and everybody else at the jail grew into a college program called Open Minds. Um, And that program brings professors and their students from VCU into the class and into the jail for these classes. Um, Shermaine taught the first class in African-American literature for Open Minds. Uh, And in that class, which was a popular class, they talked about racial identity, uh, double consciousness, citizenship and belonging in America and all across the generations and through different genres of African-American literature. And if that sounds like a personal look at our own histories through the lens of literature by African Americans, well, that's what it was. And that's what we're gonna get into uh, in today's show. This is Writing Our Way Out, the podcast, season two, episode two, Why Black History Matters. When I was younger and heard the phrase black history, whether it was in school or on the news or anywhere else, often found it easy to tune out. I had nothing against it, but I didn't know how to be in it or for it, except from the sidelines, cheering. I knew it was a month dedicated to isolated bits of history about famous black people, Uh, but it wasn't a narrative I could see in my everyday life in this suburban and mostly white upper middle class town of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Or if it was a narrative, of struggle and justice. It was a heroic story of milestone achievements from emancipation to the have a dream speech. That mattered to black people, um, but it was essentially over. It was a narrative that had ended. And the narrative uh, never included the black um, power movement. It just stopped in the 60s. Um, and none of this really involved me or my everyday life. Um, I know this is bad. <laughs> I'm in confessional mode. Um, I'm just sharing with you how it came to me when I was growing up. I did not understand what it meant to be white. My family never talked about being white or the greatness of white or anything white. It was Italian and Irish. Um, And uh, James Baldwin writes in his essay on being white, other lies, that no one was white before he or she came to America. It took generations and a vast amount of coercion before this became a white country. I can't speak for my great grandparents who emigrated here, um, but I believe they paid the price of the ticket as Baldwin describes it, of becoming American after leaving Europe. Quote, the price was to become white, to become what they never were in Europe, what they never called themselves in the old country, white. So I wanted to share that by way of explaining the title of this show, Why Black History Matters uh, and Why It Matters to Me. It isn't just history with a capital H out there, remote from our lives. It's our own personal histories of learning to see ourselves through the prism of race. That felt good to say. Hey, you know what I mean, Stan? Yeah, confession cleans the, it cleans the soul. Dave. It cleans the soul, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I just wanted to share that just to, before we get into the heart of what, what we're after tonight, um, which are these moments of, of awakening into racial consciousness. I wanted to share what happens 
through the prism of white. And we'll get we'll get through all that as we talk tonight. Um, so, Charmaine, um, I, I brought you here on the show because I would really love to hear how you approach these questions mm -hmm. through the literature. If I'm remembering right, you called your class Bearing Witness. Correct. Right? Yes. So Bearing Witness, Race, Identity, and African-American Writing. Um, and so the course examines the ways that African-Americans have historically employed writing to question identity, theorize racial consciousness, as well as to protest injustice and advocate for social change. And so many of the works that I selected meet these various criteria in terms of um, meditating on moments where people became aware of their race, right? Much like you were talking about in your personal experience, this idea of blackness is not an innate thing that you just wake up and you know that you're black, right? Often it is an encounter with whiteness, right? And often a traumatic encounter that forces you to confront what it means to be black. And Du Bois actually talks about this a, a lot, of course, in The Souls of Black Folk when he talks about double consciousness. And one of the things he says is that the unasked question that is projected onto the black body is, how does it feel to be a problem? And so I also focus a lot on affect and feeling and how people reconcile the racial identity with their emotions as well. So um, as you will see in some of the selections that I've picked, um, affect, emotions, feelings comes up quite a bit. Um, and it ranges from, you know, anger, rage, disappointment, disgust, you know, and a number of uh, shame, even a number of emotions. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Stan, do you want to hear some of this literature? I sure do. Yeah. Well, why don't we get into it then? Shermaine, hit us would, with something. Let's, let's, let's I start. I would love to. Yeah. So I'm going to start with um, um, James Baldwin, and that's always a great place to start. I, I figured yeah. that would be a great starting point because you actually um, began uh, with Baldwin. And um, you can find this um, uh, essay that was reprinted in uh, The Fire uh, Next Time but it first appeared in Progressive Magazine in 1962. And this was a letter to my nephew. And when I taught this course, I had an assignment where I actually asked students to write a letter about racial identity um, to a younger self or a younger person. But he writes this letter to his nephew and I'm going to read a portion of it and I'd love to hear your reflections on it. You were born where you were born and faced the future that you faced because you were black and for no other reason. The limits of your ambition were thus expected to be set forever. You were born into a society which spelled out with brutal clarity and in as many ways as possible that you were a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. Wherever you have turned, James, in your short time on this earth, you have been told where you could go and what you could do and how you could do it and where you could live and whom you could marry. So I just want to um, stop there. You know, he writes this letter to James, who is his namesake, his, his nephew, and um, he's spelling out for him the ways that the world views him, much like Du Bois talks about how does it feel to be a problem? And even though he you know, relishes the beauty and the artistry and the brilliance and the intellectual capacity of his nephew, he knows that the world does not always recognize that intrinsically. And so he's warning him, right? In, in, in a, a more, it's a mourning, right? He's mourning the fact that he has to warn him about how he will be perceived. So I'd love to know um, your thoughts on, on that, um, Stan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. His nephew was like 10 years old or something at the time, like a young kid. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, Stan. How, I think it's start? interesting. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Uh, I think there was a whole lot of substance in that in that small capture. Caption that you that that you, you read. Thank you. Uh, he's telling them what the rules are. He's he's socializing him and getting him to understand early in life how how you got to kayak through this thing. Right. You know, um, because if you don't do it, 
this particular way or or frame it up at least like this, it could be detrimental. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, right? Because it's Black History Month. Um, there needs to be some truth in Black history in this land. You know, so that way, right, we don't we don't have to keep repeating that same letter that, that you wrote, that 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 the writer wrote. And he wrote it in in you could hear the sincerity. Absolutely, yeah. He, he was know? saying that 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 it, that you you'll be seen as worthless. Mm. He, didn't, he didn't think he's worthless, but he said you'll be seen as that. You'll be judged. Stan, did that did that occur to you, or did that did you get that message when you were growing up at that age, just as a kid, middle school, high school, that that's how the world would see you? Well, you know, uh, school. Uh, I didn't really go to middle school. I never, I never been to high school. Uh, Uh, I learned from talking to people. You know, sure, I have a GED. Uh, I've learned that, you know, especially in my door-to-door -door sales, because I met a gentleman in, in South Carolina, and, you know, I already knew back then, back in the 80s, what South Carolina was about. But I knew based on you know and i'm kind of i'm kind of i'm kind of making a, a route into that letter i already knew that south carolina was going to view me this way i already knew it because i was trained to understand that this issue is 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 prevalent in South Carolina, and it's a lie, you know, white power. And, you know, I knocked at doors, and, you know, like the guy told me, I don't talk to, I don't talk to your kind at my front door. Oh. Mm. And the rest. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, thank you so much for sharing that, um, because you're talking about place, right? And, and the, way, the way you're born and where you're born and how all of these kind of factors inform what you think about the possibilities of your future, right? And, and so a lot of what he meditates on here is, you know, uh, about the place you're born in and how that also dictates your future, where you could live and whom you could marry, right? Um, and so in a number of these, whether you're talking about redlining and, you know, the fact that Black people weren't allowed to or, or given the loans to be able to afford to live in certain neighborhoods, um, whether you're talking about legally not being able to marry interracially or not being able to marry certainly under the institution of slavery and so forth, right? The ways in which these very mundane practices of life that we consider to be a part of the American dream are, is foreclosed, um, you know, and, and so it's, it's you were, as you were talking about the sincerity of this letter and um, the deep desire to imagine a different possibility. And as you began and you mentioned, you know, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, that, that is an exercise of radical imagination because as he begins to imagine at the end, you know, um, unity and racial reconciliation and things like that, that is not something that is immediately possible at that time. But he's able to have, whether it's his faith or you know, the radical imagination that he has, that is what he has to tap into to be able to create that future, right? And, and that's something that um, James Baldwin is mourning um, for his, his nephew here. So thank you um, for that. Um, uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit, even though we are going to engage um, under a similar theme. But um, as we were talking about going door to door, um, this idea of neighbors and, and whether you're treated neighborly, I think this is a good transition into Langston Hughes's I, too, 
because of the language of kinship and brotherhood that he uses in um, this poem that was um, also, uh, this is published in 1926. And I want us to kind of think about time and whether, you know, the letter that James Baldwin wrote, if we were to write a letter in this contemporary moment, would it actually sound that different writing to a young black child, right? Um, And with this poem, if we were to write I too in the contemporary moment, uh, does it still resonate in the same way or have there been um, significant um, changes? Unfortunately, I think for some of us, we might say this sounds very familiar even though it was written so long ago. So this is Langston Hughes's I too. Mm -hmm. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Mm. Wow. That says it all. Well, because we, we don't we don't remember that, that we are all, all America. I think there's a temptation to think of who's speaking for America. It's like that, you know, when 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 um you know remember when the riots happened at the Capitol when they stormed in yeah. and everybody was saying, This is not who we are. Okay. You remember that phrase? This is not who we are. Well, who are we? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, well, I don't know. Um some people wrote back right away, that's exactly who we are. Right. We've always stormed by violence, you know, and especially if it's white men who feel aggrieved by some injustice, well, yeah, they're going to grab, grab a gun and, and storm the Capitol. But you know what? I took that, I took that statement to this middle school <laughs> in, uh, in Churchill, at this, this um, uh, Anna Julia Cooper Middle School, a beautiful place uh, where... Uh, you know, the kids are learning, and it's a great it's a great school. Kelvin and I volunteer there, and I asked them that question. I said, "When you heard that phrase, this is who we are." And uh, these are I should have uh, prefaced that these are all African American kids living um, in North Church Hill, which is a neighborhood in Richmond, Virginia, um, near a public housing community, and that's where most of these children come from. And I said, "If you heard that phrase, this is not who we are." And one girl interrupted me right away. She said, I just know that if that were us going through the Capitol, we'd be dead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Who are we? And who gets to sit at the table? Yeah. And mm. I think I, I'd love, you know, um, uh, Stan's uh, perspective on it. I, lo- I like that the fact that you talk about a seat at the table because the imagery that he uses here, I always call my students' attention to this, is one of eating and of communion right? And of the table, mm. eat in the mm. kitchen, right? Um, but I'll be at the table, right? There's this, this uh, hope and aspiration to be able to sit and eat and, and enjoy. So, Stan, I'd love to hear kind of your interpretation. You know, um, eat it, eating at the table, mm-hmm. entitlement. I'm entitled. I have a right to eat at the table. Right. Although I'm not at the table right now, you know I I I like I like how he how he brought himself through that particular situation, mm-hmm. and you know because it says even a brick inspires to be a part of a wall, and you got to build those layers. You have to build those courses. You know, uh, I don't I don't I don't value emancipation, I don't value, you know, the Constitution, I don't, because it doesn't value me. So I really believe that in order for us as people, the community, to evolve, I think there has to be a whole lot of uh, dialogue and a whole lot of conversation, a whole lot of sketching, sketches, a whole lot of just everything, theater, commercials, everything. Because it, it, 
when we wrote about, well, I listened to about something that was diabolical. You know how this thing, right? It was, it was, it, it only could produce wealth. It only could produce evil. It only could produce a slave. You re-socialized me. You know, to get me to believe, right, that I was what brother? <laughs> the, the dog brother. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> you know, and, and and I don't I I I think that that hurt people hurt people and, and I think that we as a nation are hurt not just because we inflicted pain but but because we received some too you know on on all levels white black on all levels i just think i like the word reconciliation you know i really do and i i i, I would like to write a letter to the next generation right because it's a baton you got to pay you know, it's a baton, and and, and it's it's it's, it's kind of like how people say uh, that that you can clone something, but it gets diluted it, the more you clone it. it we've got to we've got to start putting a new mindset into our children, so they can put it into their children, so we can so we can eradicate. So we can eradicate some of this toxic ass, you know, entitlement issues, you know. Thank you. You know, I think um, the the turn to a focus on the future is a good one because um, both Baldwin mm -hmm. and Hughes use that kind of language. You know, Baldwin mm -hmm. says you were born and faced the future that you faced because you were black and for no other reason. And for Langston Hughes, as he, if you notice the tense shift you know, I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen. But when he says tomorrow, this is again, imagining what the future could possibly look like. Now, I think your language of reconciliation is interesting. And I'd love to know what that means and what that looks like. For him, it's um, having a seat, you know, at the table. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes and nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen. <laughs> but, um, you know, at the end of the poem, it says that they'll see him actually recognize, you know, his beauty or her beauty, whoever the speaker is of this poem, right? Um, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed, right? So a part of that reconciliation may be a, a shame, right? A shaming, right? Um, of, of America, if there is going to be an atonement. And so that we might want to think about um, what that really means and what it means to kind of wrestle with that history and the present uh, injustices and the way that shame has to, to factor into that. And rather than projecting that shame onto black bodies, that shame needs to be housed and inhabited by those who are oppressors, right? Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and that might be, if there is to be any form of reconciliation, a reckoning that has to happen. So thank you um, for that. Um, so I'm going to switch gears again a little bit. We're going to turn to Zora Neale Hurston. I don't know if you've read any of her work, um, but this is from an essay called How It Feels to Be Colored Me. And this is uh, written in 1928. And she says um, this, I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. Mm, mm, mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So beside the waters of the Hudson, I feel my race. Among the thousand white persons, I am a dark rock surged upon and overswept. But through it all, I remain myself. When covered by the waters, I am, and the ebb but reveals me again. But um, I wanted to give a larger context of the quote, but based on just your uh, response, I feel like I'm in a Baptist church right now. You're like, mm, mm, mm. okay. So, I, I want to meditate on the beginning uh, of that, you know, uh, passage that I read. I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. You had such a visceral response to that. And I'd love to know what, you know, I mean, you 
groaned or grunted or something. There was something uh, immediate in your response. So what was the affect? What was the feeling that you experienced when you heard those words? I remember, <laughs> you know, uh, and I grew up over the West End, over there with Bird Park, good neighborhood. Uh, you know, I used to dress, you know, uh, uh, used to be a place, uh, Robin Hall, and I used to wear, I, I wanted to wear husky, but I was wearing slim. <laughs> I didn't like the word slim. <laughs> I wanted husky. But going to school, you know, dressing nice, my mother, you know, uh, you know, guys used to, used to, to damn it, take my coat off me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wasn't aggressive, but I knew that was my coat and I can't go home without my coat. And, you know, my father told me, right, that he, just like the letter, he verb, verbally, verb, come on, help me out. Verbalized, dude. He verbalized <laughs> and told me what need, I don't think you put it right. Babe. Verbally, verbally. Verbally, right. And yeah. he, gave, he gave me the instructions. Yeah. You know? And to protect myself and to protect my property, and protect my sisters and protect my dog. And you know when 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 I had an altercation with the background <laughs> of that sharp white paper, you know, yeah. it I was I was a victim, but it was turned around. Because protecting myself against somebody that looked like me is okay. But protecting myself against that white background is not okay. And you know, my father told me, and I was like maybe, I was maybe like 11 years old, 12 years old. You know, he said, but they were white. You know, and what does that mean? <laughs> 12 years old, what does that mean? And he never, he never, he never broke it down all the way to me because maybe he didn't know how, you know, because he had lived this way for so long. But the rest of my life, I've been finding out, but they're white and we can see it Today, the riot, well, when, when the riders went up in there, but they're white, you know? Uh, so that's just some of my feelings. Hmm. Yeah, you know, thank you so much. Uh, Dave, were you going to say something? I'm sorry. Uh, just that I, I remember him, him telling that story, and then there was another one similar to that he told about parole. Um, it wasn't parole, no, sorry, Stan, when you were in, Juvenile, you had to make a meeting with a parole officer, and your father carried you out. To oh, tell tell Charmaine that story too. That's that's really good. It relates. I'm to gonna this. tell on him, Charmaine. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, Williamsburg, Murray Mac Trail. Uh, forget the clown's name. Uh, that PO that I had. Uh, I have been in contact. When you get out of prison, you have to make contact within 48 hours or something. And, you know, I was calling him. He said, meet him here. Uh, and I got my father. You know, I wasn't driving. I got my father to, to, and this was an old guy. My father was an old cat, to take me to, to, to where he told me to meet him. But when I got to, when we went from Providence Forge to Williamsburg, he wasn't there. So I called him. He said, okay, meet me such and such. So we had to drive another 40, 50 miles, right? And when we got into his office, no one was in his office. And well, the place, his makeshift office. So me and my father sit down and, and a white guy come in, white guy come in. And uh, my PO, which was of his tribe, asked me, <laughs> to step aside don't eat in the kitchen <laughs> you know and 
you know, like I told him, hey, listen, I have my father with me. We was here. You said to meet you there. But because, but because I voiced that, that white background, you know, he said that uh, that uh, I was confrontational <laughs> and all of this. You know, and, and you get to a point, right, that, you know, I'm an African-American male. Uh, been there, done that. If it doesn't make sense to me, you can get your best people. I'll sit down and give them a shot and I'll listen. But it just don't make sense. So now I'm to a point that if it doesn't make sense, I just don't do it. Regardless. Um, I, I, I join these and I participate as because I, I, I truly want to give. And I know that I know that writing and I know that connecting through ever whatever means, you know, we have to connect. Y'all think that it's strange, right? That 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 you can't come out, you can't do this, right? It's 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 a different life. But I can remember being at Greensville and in the whole and you can't, I can't physically see this guy. We can't talk. And you'll take, you'll take, you'll, you'll unwind your sheets and you'll put a rope on there, right? And you'll slide something up under the door because you need to communicate. We need to communicate. We need to communicate to, to our tomorrows. Thank you uh, so much for sharing that. As you were talking about, you know, your early experience with, you know, honoring yourself by protecting yourself and standing up for yourself and how that's read differently, depending on who you're in that interaction or that confrontation with. I was thinking about, you know, Richard Wright's The Ethics of Living Jim Crow, where mm. he did have, um, it was like they were throwing stones at each other, black and white, you know, but uh, he ended up being harshly harshly beaten by his mother when his mother realized that he um, defended himself, right, mm. um, against white boys, because that, that becomes a, a, a liability. And But how that indoctrinated him into thinking that he didn't have equal worth, right? And so, and it's it's a very, especially as a, a new parent, you know, it, it is a really precarious position to be in, to navigate what do you share with your children? How do you attempt to protect them as much of, as, as possible? And how do you actually wrestle with the, the reality that you, you really can't protect them in some ways, right? And that they are going to have these uncomfortable encounters, these uh, traumatic racial encounters in which they won't be seen the way that you see them, right? And so affirmations for, for Black children is just so pivotal. Um, so I, I thank you. I thank you for sharing that. Um, I think, you know, the, the thing about I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background is also to think about the violence of that, it's thrown, right? Not just up against, but thrown against. That's about force. And that is uh, not a, a force that's a, a, of your choice. It's, it's, it's not a, a consented, um, you know, connection, right? Um, in, in that encounter. And then, you know, the, the sharp white background, right? That to be thrown against something sharp is gonna cause injury, both physiologically to the body, right? Um, corporally, but also, um, you know, to your emotions, right? That there's a kind of wounding because even Stan, as you talked about these encounters that happened, you know, decades ago, there's there's still grief and there's still sadness and, and injury that, that happened there, you know? So I, I thank you for your vulnerability and for, um, for sharing. Um, that. So um, I am going to uh, read a passage from Claudia Rankin, Citizen, an American Lyric, and this is 2014. And it, and it speaks to, you know, this has worked out really well, some of the, the concerns about children and how to protect them and what that means and, and so forth. But I'm going to let it speak for itself and then just get your reaction. It's um, mm -hmm. an anecdote that's featured in the text. And it says, a man knocked over her son in the subway. You feel your own body wince. 
he's okay, but the son of a bitch kept walking. She says she grabbed the stranger's arm and told him to apologize. I told him to look at the boy and apologize. And yes, you wanted to stop. You want the black child pushed to the ground to be seen, to be helped to his feet and to be brushed off not brushed off by the person that did not see him, has never seen him, has perhaps never seen anyone who is not a reflection of himself. The beautiful thing is that a group of men began to stand behind me like a fleet of bodyguards, she says, like newly found uncles and brothers. Mm. Wow. That's a main piece. You know, I, I just got to just add one little bit, just, I mean, because a lot of these stories have the white is in the background or it's the one throwing or it's the one causing the injury. And I, I just wanted to shout out to all my white listeners. Like, do you identify with this? Because it's sometimes hard to realize that just being white is being a part of that because you, you're thinking, oh, I didn't throw anybody. I didn't, I didn't push any kid. I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, miss up an appointment and tell the black kid to get away. But look, I'm, I'm a professional. I could have been that parole officer. I could have been that teacher. I could have been that person doing that. I could have been that one who bumped a kid mm -hmm. and didn't recognize that kid as my kid, as, as a kid, as a kid, as a, as a vulnerable, beautiful kid. And that's the thing that, that why, what I said earlier in the show about why Black History Matters is that I think it's still unfolding in the way we act and the way we all perceive each other. You know, and, and to see yourself not so much as the background or the injurious force, but as, as an ally is really important. Just wanted to share that. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, I love the times that we're in. I love it. Um, it's nothing, it, there's nothing like, like, like riding a, a temperate storm out. There's nothing like it. You know, there's nothing like 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 playing sports and you're actually you you're in the toughest you're in the toughest match of your life uh there's nothing like uh being young right and you ain't real sure if you can beat this guy's ass but damn it i'm gonna give him everything i got i'm ready for this you know i, I, I done done my push-ups you know uh i believe in myself i talked and looked myself in the mirror program myself. Uh, this land is our land. This land is your land. All of this right here is, is everything that we're going through. It's, it's going to take us somewhere. It's going to take us to the table. It's going to take us to the table. And, and those with education, doctors and uh, uh, the degrees. Uh, you remember what Cornell West said, Dave? Mm -hmm. uh, at VCU? He said that, and, and I'm just going to start it off because I know you did. Uh, you remember the dot the I's and <laughs> what page it was and everything. What time? I'll Cornell West. Okay, Cornell West said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna warm it up, Dave. Cornell West said that after you get your degree, you go to work and you'll have a certain amount of success. What was the second part, Dave? Your your goal in being an educated person is to be a liberating force for everybody, is to transform the world. Mm -hmm. If you look at it with just yourself mm -hmm. and your job or your money or whatever, you're you're missing the whole point of what an education is. Exactly. I'm not getting his exact quote, but I know that was what, the spirit of it, right? You framed it. You framed it. And what, you know, I see a whole lot of different challenges. You know, I see a whole lot, you know, this challenge and that challenge. Uh, what I do every day, I make sure I speak. I make sure I greet them, whether they greet me or not, because I see them. And that's what we, we we need to do. We need to see people. Just not, you know, in prison, right? Hey, you know, 
I seen a whole lot, but I didn't look at it, you know? And we're living in a time now that you need to see people. You need to see them. Because if if you don't, if, if you can't identify with them, right? Then just say, hey, listen, I'm gonna go and, and get in on this, right? Because I need to, I need more training. I need, I need more, more, more people to assist me to 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 take off some of these these dysfunctions that I have. And I have a willing heart. You know, I didn't know how to make it out here. I didn't. I was a criminal. But I had a willing heart. Okay, uh panel, go to work. <laughs> yeah, we we are we are we are closing in on it and it it's to be seen is really the heart of it. How it how can we actually honor the humanity we're seeing. Shermaine, I was wondering if you could you could offer some closing remarks mm-hmm. on that about yeah. where 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 we are now in this. Because you mentioned the letter, you started off with the letter James Baldwin wrote to his to his nephew. Uh, Stan talked about writing letters to the future, to the next generation. So we have this continuum. You even mentioned uh, how graciously your own your own baby, your your daughter, and 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 uh, so we have. This continuum, we know that this question is not going away. We're going to have Black History Month again next year, and we're trying to see how we can live this history. What what advice would you have for us as to how we think about this as we move forward? You know, I think, um, as Dan was saying, is um, there is a desire. We all, as human beings, have a desire to be seen, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, all of the works that we actually looked at this um, this evening from James Baldwin, what he was talking about is a misidentification of humanity of his nephew, right? Mm-hmm. That people would look at him and misidentify him, misidentify him as a trespasser rather than someone who belongs, misidentify him as a, as, you know, someone who is not of worth, even though he is valuable, right? Similarly, you know, in the Langston Hughes piece, there is this anxiety about I'm going to be misidentified as someone who needs to be put in the back rather than someone who's a part of this community um, and deserves to have a seat at the table. And mm. in this latter piece that we just read, you know, it's about not even being seen at all. In the rush and in the busyness of trying to get where he was going, he pushed a little boy who may not even be recognized as a little boy. And we see the consequences of that with Tamir Rice and so many children, right? right are killed because they were misidentified. They're not seen as human. They're not seen as vulnerable. They're not seen as children. And so even the objects that they're playing with are then misidentified. Hmm. First, they're seen as black and therefore dangerous and therefore not children. And we know also within the criminal justice system that young black children are charged more as adults more than their white counterparts. So there are severe consequences to misidentifying someone and not seeing them as fundamentally a human being. Brent Staples talks about this in his essay on black men in public spaces, that he was jogging and we, we saw the consequences of this this summer, right? So he was writing this in the 19, uh, late 80s, early 1990s. Talks about being a, a student at, at uh, the University of Chicago, and he liked to run. But every mm-hmm. time he would run at night, he would be identified as a, a rapist by white women who were running, right? They, they, that is how his body was read. And there are consequences deadly consequences for the misidentification of people. So I I think there needs to be empathy. There needs to be an understanding of our shared humanity. How we get there, that's a really kind of complicated thing. But I think it's it's first uh, to to be seen and to be, um, to to, to go back to, you know, if you talk about children, a, a very basic rule of you know, treating others how you would you would want to be treated and seeing the humanity in others, right? Because um, like I said, you know, consequences for thinking that Black people can um, survive uh, with more pain, right? They don't feel pain as intently or they don't have, you know, as developed emotions, right? Thomas Jefferson was saying this, you know, hundreds of years ago, but there's still consequences for that in pain management and policing and so forth for Black people in the contemporary moment. So what happens if we 
actually recognize Black humanity. And that's why it's so important to say things like Black Lives Matter, right? It's not just a hashtag. It's not something really simple um, that we can just say, well, all lives matter. No, if you really believe that, then you will say Black Lives Matter because in our lived experience, that is not what, what we're seeing, right? And that also, again, when we recognize our shared humanity, then we also recognize why people say, I can't breathe. Not just because, unfortunately, Eric Garner died saying that and George Floyd died saying that as well, but because it represents this kind of what I call an affective asphyxia, the sense of this emotional suffocation that Black people experience, having to choke down their rage, their grief, and all these emotions that we experience, seeing ourselves constantly being vulnerable and fragile to assault and, 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 and murder in some cases. So what happens if we greet our um, Black people with compassion and understanding and empathy and, and genuine humanity and, and, and say, you know, Black Lives Matter. And that would be a pathway to resuscitation. That would be a pathway to, to breath, you know, and to potentially not having to lament having certain conversations with our children where we're essentially preparing them to be assaulted by the world. Now, I wish I could be more hopeful about that, mm. that reality coming to pass um, sooner rather than later, <clears throat> but um, I am inspired by, by our young people right now who are so fervent, who are so insistent, and who are so unapologetic about what they desire, what they want, and um, and I, and I think we can trust them, you know, with the future. I'm inspired by that too. And, and, and I, I love the idea of just greeting. Gre start with a greeting that, that just shares what we all have in common, like Stan was, was describing earlier. Just make an effort, make an effort. And then let's see what can grow from that. And I'm not gonna be all Pollyanna and say it's gonna go away with a greeting. But I do think it starts when you open up your mind to what history we all share and where, where we're all going together, our shared fate, right? Mm. That's it with, with you all right, Dan? Amen. Amen. Okay. <laughs> and all right, hey, hey, that's our show. That's our show. And thank you all for listening. And thank you to Stan and to Shermaine for being here. If you all thank want- Thank you, Shermaine. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And then, Dave, Dave, I love you, man. Yeah, I love you too, brother. Hey, if you all want to learn more Shout about out to Rob. you want to hear previous episodes, you can go to writingourwayout.com. You can also listen to the show on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, where I hope you'll subscribe. Please leave us a review on uh, Apple Podcasts if that's how you hear the show. We would love to hear from you. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, and Instagram. Reach out and let us know what you're thinking. The theme music for this show was written by my brother, Chris Coogan. You can learn more about him <laughs> at CooganMusic.com. And you already shot <laughs> out for Rob, but this show is produced by Rob Crocker, a PhD student in media, art, and text at VCU, and his amazing crew of interns from the School of Mass Communication. Excuse me, the mm -hmm. Rob. Thank you, Rob. Of media and culture. And we will all see you next time on Writing Our Way Out, the podcast. Thanks again for listening. Jamie. Thank you. Mm -hmm.